All right. Hello, everyone. It's Katie from the Clark Museum. Uh, we have a, probably about five or ten minutes before we go ahead and get started today. I just wanted to get this video started. Um, I'm using my phone, so it's a little different this time. Um, so we'll just kind of wait for people to kind of log on. Um, so yeah, I'll kind of wait a little bit. Oh. All right. So feel free to type any questions you might have before the tour in our little uh, comment box, I guess you can say. Um, and uh, I will try to get to those during the tour. Um, if I don't, I will definitely catch them at the end. Um, so... Go ahead and get let people log on real quick. <laughs> I'm wearing a mask today because the visitor center is actually open. Um, the museum is closed for right now, so I'm just wearing a mask just to be safe. All right. So we'll let people log on. Let me go out here real quick. Flip this around.
All right, everyone, it's two o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. So my name's Katie, and I'm the interim director curator at the Clark Museum here in Old Town. Um, we're in this really great bank building. It was built in 1912. And today we'll be taking a tour of the museum, checking out some of the exhibits that are open, um, or that were opened when we were open last week. Uh, we're now closed again, but the visitor center is open for right now. Um, so we'll be checking out kind of what's closed. So first things first, uh, the museum was founded um, in this location, at least in 1960 by Cecile Clark. There's her happy face looking over us all the time. Um, so she was a local high school teacher. Oh no, how do I, I zoom back out? Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, she was a local high school teacher at Eureka High School. Um, she grew up in Mendocino County and kind of got into history through um, in uh, archeology span that she did um, in Mendocino County. And she grew up on a sheep farm. Um, and from there, she went to UC Berkeley, or what's now UC Berkeley, then she came back up here to teach. Um, so in, you know, so she taught at Eureka High School for many, many years. When she retired in 1960, she purchased this bank building with some money from her family's sheep farm and moved all of her collections here from Eureka High School. She had been running out of room because she was a very avid collector. So she moved all of her collections here and here they've stayed for the last 60 years. So this is kind of the entrance to the museum. We'll start checking out our main hall exhibits and then we'll go check out uh, Neela's Hall. All right, here we go. Behind the scenes. All right, so when you first walk into the main hall, this is kind of what you see. Um, in this current exhibit, it's called Immigration Expulsion Homecoming, and it's about the legacy of the Chinese expulsion in Humboldt County. Um, so as you may know, but you might not know, there was a Chinese population that lived in Humboldt County during the Gold Rush era, and there was a pretty sizable population. Um, they came here from a very particular region in China. You can see them here. Um, there it is, that little dirt, that part. Um, and they came out here mostly to, to mine gold. But then eventually at the point that the Transcontinental Railroad was being built, Chinese workers were also recruited specifically to come out here um, and build railroads. So they came out here to Humboldt County. So I'm just gonna do like a quick run through of this exhibit because we did do an entire video series on this exhibit specifically. So I'll just kind of point out some highlights, some things that I think are particularly interesting. We'll start over here for that part. So these items, along with the items in the other two cases that are kind of near here, were all found up in storage um, on a shelf simply labeled Chinese items. Um, so it's been kind of interesting trying to figure out what the stories are behind these items. Some of them were brought by missionaries to China, brought back to Humboldt County. Um, and then some of them just don't really have any information on how we got them. Um, some of them are ones that Cecile had gotten hold of one way or another. These are pretty cool little candlesticks. These are some, these are a bound foot shoe. Um, it's very small. This one was found in Weaverville, which had a pretty sizable Chinese population for a significantly longer amount of time than Eureka did. All right. So this is one that kind of catches people's eyes as well. It has to do with opium usage um, and kind of the criminalization of various drugs used by different populations. Got all kinds of different, and I believe this whole set here was brought from a missionary who had gone to China, if I remember right. Yeah. And then these are opium pipes up here. This, and so is a small one. And then this smaller one is actually for cigarettes rather than opium, but it kind of 
It was with everything else, which was kind of strange. Anyway, so if you ever want to learn about a pretty interesting history about the evolution of a recreational slash medical drug turned into a criminalized drug, um, opium is one to really check out. And also along the way, feel free to ask questions if you got any questions. Um, mentioned Weaverville a little earlier. This is also a pretty interesting little piece here. So I went and visited the Joss House in Weaverville and the Trinity County Historical Society, which are located eh, about a block away from each other. And when I was there, um, I was talking to their historians and they had this whole documentation of um, different documents from Chinese folks and articles and all kinds of things. And this was one they shared with me. So this is an envelope, it's got writing on it. And then this is a letter inside of it. And the, the copy isn't super good, so I'm not really sure how the paper was actually laid out, but this is just kind of what we got. And then there's a translation, um, which is always kind of entertaining. So I'll just read part of it. So this is to inform my big brother. I, your younger brother, have a problem caused by the behavior of this prostitute, which has been frequently not good. But there's nothing mon much one can do Thinking it over and over, I have no strategies to deal with this problem. I have no alternative but to plan on returning home to China soon and not wanting to stay with her. But he's also in debt, so it makes him hard for him to travel home. Um, and it's funny because my, my office and my desk is right there. And I frequently see people when we're open come through and read this and call their friends over to come check it out. Um, so anyway, that's just kind of an interesting little part of the exhibit. Um, let's go over here. And this is probably kind of my favorite spot in the exhibit, is talking about the factors that led to the 1885 Chinese expulsion and later expulsion events. Um, I definitely encourage you to check out the video where I spend, I think I spend like 10 or 15 minutes talking just about this, this display. Um, I won't rehash it here, but I do definitely recommend you rewatch it or watch it if you haven't seen it at all. So just a quick little glance at that, and then we'll move right along. These are two sets of clothes that we found in storage when we were uh, working on the exhibit. And they're, let's actually get kind of close because I'm not gonna touch it, but we will get a closer look. So this is all silk embroidery, which is pretty darn impressive. Um, and this particular example has held up really well over the years, and probably because it was mostly in storage. Um, this particular coat, overcoat, and skirt set would have been someone's fancy clothes. They wouldn't have worn these every day, which probably also, you know, explains why they're in such good shape. This is kind of a part that people don't usually see because it's way down here. But yeah, isn't that pretty incredible? And unfortunately with this, the record keeping on it was not good. So we actually don't know kind of the larger story of this clothes, this set of clothing. Um, so if you happen to have uh, expertise in Chinese clothing and being able to figure out how old it is, please give us a call. I would love to hear it. Um, yeah, all right. go put that back all right this is a tapestry that was also found in that same box um, I'd really love to know a lot more about this but we don't really have much information um, so really quick I'm actually gonna hop over here so I'm gonna show you this this is pretty cool this was put up right before we reopened last week, so not many people have gotten to see him. But this is Charlie. He's a California condor. Sorry, the reflection is kind of funky because of the lighting. There he is. So Charlie is very, very old. He was taxidermied in 1899. Um, and he's a California condor. So California condors um, were thought to be locally extinct by about 1900, um, but they were still around in other parts of the country. But by 1985, there were not a whole lot left. So the remaining birds were taken out of 
uh, the wild and put into captivity into a breeding program. And now there's, I think their population is numbering in the hundreds and they are being released back into the wild in places like the Grand Canyon. And there's a project right now to reintroduce them up here um, in Humboldt County. And the Yurok tribe is um, working with the National Park Service and US Fish and Wildlife um, to do that. And they've been working on it since 2003. Last I heard that they're, is that they're planning on reintroducing a bird possibly in 2021, which would be really cool. Um, these things are huge if you haven't seen one in person. Um, they are very, very large. They can weigh between 15 and 21 pounds and have a nine foot wingspan. <laughs> so if you get, you know, two fourth graders, have them stand with their arms out, fingertip to fingertip, uh, that's about the wingspan of one of these birds. And it's really cool because they're so big, they rely a lot on updrafts near hillsides to be able to glide around. And I have read a thing where um, condors have been actually recorded flying about 100 miles without any, um, without flapping their wings. Pretty nuts. So this is Charlie. I'm happy he gets to see everyone and I'm sure you guys are all going to want to come see him when we can reopen. Check out these talons. Pretty crazy. Don't want to mess with Charlie. He will fight you. All right, so real check, real quick. Here's some of Charlie's friends, other taxidermy birds. Got some local ones like the marbled merlet down here. Of course, these little dudes um, live in old growth redwoods, but fly out to the ocean in different water um, areas to eat. Got all kinds of owls. We've got grebes. If you hang out on the bay long enough, you'll see these little dudes. They don't really look like they have tails, which is kind of funny. Oh man, it's really reflective. Okay, there you go. They don't really have tails, which I find that to be kind of interesting. Anyway, all right, Victorian room. So quick little glance around. It's kind of dark in here, so I'm not sure how this is gonna work out on my phone, but yeah, I'll take a quick look around in here. So, the Victorian period uh, was a really important time period for kind of settlement communities here in Humboldt County. It was a time period where there were small classes of people gaining lots and lots of money from things like the timber industry and various other extraction industries. So kind of when most people think of the Victorian period, they think of Victorian homes, you know, things like the Carson Mansion, the Pink Lady, um, all the old Victorians we have around here in Old Town. Um, and of course, they're from that period, and they're very distinctive in their style. So this room is to kind of trying to give you a little bit of an idea of what the interior of a Victorian home might look like. You'll notice when you look around, there's a lot of, well, stuff. So Victorian period people highly valued stuff. So you'll look around and see, you know, like this kind of geisha-like figure over here. You'll notice um, there's kind of this basket down here. Uh, let's see, you know, shells and things like that. So travel was way easier for Victorian people than it was for kind of in the history of the West. Um, you could travel by train, you could travel by boat, you could get places faster and faster um, as time went on. So you, as a Victorian person, as a wealthy, you know, upper class Victorian person, you might travel around, you might collect these cool knickknacks, and you might display them in your home in this room, which is called the parlor. And it was kind of as a way to show off in a way to other people that I am a well-traveled person. I have been places, I've brought cool things back. Let's have a discussion about them, that kind of thing. Um, so the kind of the, there was two different parlors in many of these homes. One of them was kind of the formal entertaining parlor. So when someone came, you know, called on you with their calling cards, which here are kind of some examples of those. Um, you know, they might have the person's name on it and then they drop it off. Um, you know, you might bring them into your formal parlor. You might chit chat, have some tea maybe. Um, and then a lot of times there'd be a secondary parlor that would be called 
more like the family room. So that might be kind of more what this is. So you'll notice there's a piano here. There's this kind of thing right here. A little hard to see here. Let me see if I can. There we go. So this is actually called a magic lantern. So you'd put these glass slides in it and you'd have a candle or sometimes even like a wick with um, and it would project the wall that goes along with it, or stories, or things like that. The family room was where you hung out as a family um, and kind of spent time together. There wasn't, you know, TV or anything like that at the time, so you kind of had to find ways to entertain yourself. There might also be a room where you, you know, read, kind of relax, hang out a bit. So this room back here is kind of a hybrid of kind of both those rooms. There's another piano, or this is a pump organ. Um, you know, another sitting area, these really, really comfy looking couches. It would be nice to take a nap, but you know, can't see the furniture. So, um, you know, here's a bed here. It's a quilt called, um, that particular pattern is Drunkard's Path, also known as, um, oh man, what's that one called? Um, Robbing Peter to pay Paul, that's what it's called. Um, and then we have this doll here. She haunts my dreams. Um, some children's toys here. Which we have kids tours coming. Always catches their eyes, and they always ask me questions if these come alive at night. I don't believe they do. I really hope they don't. That would be scary. But anyway, you'll notice there's some really elaborate you know, furniture in here. This is probably one of my favorite elaborate carvings on it. You've got some kind of knickknacks and things. So if you're looking for some really cool furniture to just kind of feast your eyes on, this is the place to go. That picture is also substantial. So that's a hand stitched piece, which is incredible because that thing is huge. It's got to be almost five feet long by four or five feet tall. It is very substantial. So anyway, that's a Victorian room. All kinds of paintings and things like that. Got some... So this... This and this light are both from the Amelia Carson Mansion. Also that one in the corner there. Are from the Amelia Carson Mansion. So if you haven't heard of that, I think I did a blog article on that a while back. You can look up Amelia Carson Mansion Clark Historical Museum and it should pop up. Really interesting story. That's where the Time Standard Building uh, currently stands. So, all right. Bye-bye, Victorian room. We're going to head on to the next room. So this next room we're going into is the... Uh, it actually reopened in March. Or... Reopened in January as the Weapons Vault and then opened with this exhibit at the beginning of March. And then, of course, we closed. So not many people got to see it. We'll take a quick little look around. I'm hoping to have the um, the exhibit presenters come by and do an actual tour of this. They were the people that put it together. I feel like they would be able to tell the story as it should be told, but we'll take a quick look around in here. So this is a really special temporary exhibit. It's on um, Japanese internment camps. So while there wasn't one up here, we'll take a look at this map, well, there wasn't a internment camp up here. There was one in Thule Lake. Of course, there's Manzanar that kind of everyone reads about at one point or another. And there were other ones all across the country, which is pretty incredible. Um, I know when I was in school, I didn't really learn too much about this besides that it happened and then moving on. So having this opportunity to explore how this national event affected us locally is really special. Um, so the items that you're going to see on display in here are all items that were brought to camp, made in camp, or brought from camp by local families or individuals who were sent to internment camps or are related to people who were. Um, so it's really, it's drawing that larger picture into the more local. Um, so let's take a look at some of these items. And like I mentioned, I'm hoping to get um, have some of the tour, some of the people who put this together to come in and tell these stories, but we'll take a look. So these are some certificates of identification. Do a little close up here so you can kind of see the details on them. So 
these are the grandparents of Linda Broadman and Mike Fukushima and Vicki Ozaki, all from McKinleyville. Um, let's see. So these are alien identification cards. They had to carry them around with them wherever they went in the U.S. Um, and they had to present them to the police or other officials if they were asked to do so. So... got an indefinite leave card here. So this was when um, Ray Ozaki was able to leave Heart Mountain Detention Camp with his mother. This is the card he got to leave. Um, and when people did leave the camps, they were issued a bus ticket and 25 bucks. Um, these are some of my favorite pieces here, these um, sketchbooks. They're pretty incredible. Um, these are all done... Um, from scenes relating to Heart Mountain. So these are also by Roy Ozaki, who we just saw in that um, indefinite leave card. He drew all these. And you can see, you know, kind of everyday scenes in camp, kind of have some, some things going on, what, that, what the barracks looked like. These are pretty incredible. These are some of my favorites. And of course, life went on when people were in camps. These are some yearbooks, a graduation diploma, a class photo, all from Manzanar, including a golf course that some of the residents put together. This, along with a couple of other pieces, were made in camp using just kind of reacquired wood that residents found. These are, this is one of the other pieces that was made from reclaimed wood as well. And it's, it's really gorgeous. They used packing crates and then other wood that they kind of just found to make these, um, these cabinets. Pretty incredible. Use what you can. And these are some pieces of art that were made in camp. These were made at Manzanar. Um, pretty incredible pieces. Look at that. And, you know, looking at art that's made in these camps kind of gives you a little bit of a glimpse into how emotions were drawn up regarding being in these camps, you know, like being a fish out of water in the desert. You know, and people took up hobbies as well. Things like carving and painting, which is where these two paintings came from. But also like these pieces, these carvings. And then as for things that people brought with them, check this out. So this is an instrument. Let me get this real quick. This is an instrument. It's called a koto, and let's see, I, uh, how tall am I? I'm like 5'8", and it's probably about as tall as me. It might be a little bit taller. Actually, it might be a good bit taller. I'm not the best at measuring um, from the fly, but that, this was an instrument, so I'm just gonna read the tag on this while you're kind of taking a look at it. Um, so it says, uh, Koto, Tazu Fukushima, who's the woman who owned it, Topaz Concentration Camp. Our grandmother, Ta Tazu Fukushima, carried her Koto from her home in Richmond, California to Tanforan, I think I said that right, Assembly Center, and finally to Topaz Concentration Camp. Imagine how treasured this Koto was to be carried from her home to the camp and back. This Koto is a traditional stringed instrument with 13 strings and movable bridges. So, of course, when people were removed from their homes or were forced to leave their homes, they could only take what they could carry. So, it's pretty incredible that this instrument was one of the things that she decided to take with her when she was forced to leave. I thought that was incredible when they brought that in. I was like, what is that? And they're like, you're not going to believe this story. So, this is also something that was made in camp. Um, from 
some desert wood. And there's kind of a bird, bird shape here on the top. Oh, that's really blurry. Bird shape. This is kind of a snake. It's kind of got a head carved onto it. Um, pretty incredible. Linoleum cut prints. So another kind of expression of art in these very, very difficult times. Here's kind of a list of all the different camps, which there were a number of. I highly recommend looking more into these camps if you have a chance. There's a whole lot of history that luckily people are saving and starting to bring forward. Um, this is a picture of, this is a wedding photo from Topaz concentration camp. Um, like I said, life continues on even when you're interned. Um, but of course it's, it's different when, when you're interned. Just for an idea of how the size of these camps in fall of 1943, it's a panorama, so I'll kind of do a little stroll this way. And if you've ever been out to Manzanar, which is out in the Owens Valley, in kind of southern, centrally-ish California, it just kind of looks like a bunch of dirt now because all these barracks and buildings were taken down. Of course, this is Hart Mountain, but Manzanar was set up very similarly with all these barracks. They were all taken down, um, just some of the slabs are left, and I think the school auditorium, um, but there's their museum there does an excellent job. I highly recommend visiting it if you ever get the chance. Um, <clears throat> okay. So yearbooks, autograph books, you know, things, this was right before Rory left camp. Um, people signed the signature book. Um, and it's like, look at this one. So I'll read the first line up here. When shall the war come to an end, you may ask. If each man realizes truth and becomes Buddha, you do not have to wait for it until tomorrow. August 30th, or October 30th, 1944. Let's see, so this one says, it has been a pleasure to know you and to have your enthusiastic participation in classwork. I am sorry I will not be able to know you better, but you, your return to normal American living is the most important um, in your life, I think is what that says. My very best wishes, Miss Martin. Martin, I think that's what it is. Got some family photos. I think, yeah, so let's see. So the kind of the caption that goes with these ones is these were photos from when this family was taken or was removed from their home in El Centro. Um, this is a, their identification numbers that they had to wear. Um, of course, there's some military police here. All right, so last little quick bit here and then we'll move along to Neelis Hall. These are some of my other favorite pieces, which let me turn this light off so we can kind of see them. <clears throat> um, so these are bird pins that are hand carved based on real birds um, with pictures taken from the Audubon um, bird book, which is a very famous bird drawing book. And so this, along with, you know, all the other art that kind of came, or much of the other art that came out of this period, um, is seen as part of this art of gaman, which means enduring with unseemingly unbearable, uh, enduring the seemingly unbearable with patience and dignity. For many Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II, art was a way to gaman. And there are some great posters in here. I highly recommend um, learning more about these camps. 
All right, so last little circle around. Let me see if I can, okay. And away we go onto Neelis Hall. So Neelis Hall is this section over here. It was added onto the museum um, in 1979. It was the same year that uh, Cecile passed away, um, but there was a great effort to have this building added on to house specifically her basketry collection. So sorry, that's kind of a quick little scan. Um, so this building, uh, the land was donated. The building was built by the city of Eureka and we technically rent it from the city. So we'll just kind of do a little, little scan, give you a chance to look, but of course we'll go check out some of these other things in detail. So for those of you that don't know, Eureka is on um, the traditional territory of the Wiat, which is right here. And the place where Eureka now stands um, was a spot that was called by the Wiat as Jarujiji, which was a place you would sit and rest, um, presumably from paddling your canoe, you'd stop here and then continue up to what is now Arcata Bay, um, which the area that Arcata's in um, was then known as Gudini, um, which is kind of in the redwoods. And my pronunciation needs to get a little better, but I'm working on it. <laughs> um, so this is kind of a great little map. It's really important to know whose traditional land you're standing on. Um, if you want more information on that, the HSU Native American Studies Program does a really great job of providing all kinds of resources to learn more about that. Um, all right. So let's get started going over here. So I think we have about a half hour. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to toss them in the comments. There haven't been too many yet, so um, I should be able to see them and answer them as we go along here. So this first exhibit is on, it's called Women's Ceremonial Dresses Long Ago and Today. So let's see, where do I start? So. One of the things that you'll see if you're looking at native cultures is are the regalia items. And those are usually the things that ended up end up getting preserved above kind of everyday use items. And partially that has to do with how elaborate they are. You know, um, early collectors were really drawn to things that were particularly unusual. Um, so you'll see that kind of presented in many museum collections. So let's take a look here. So this is called an apron. Um, traditional you know, dresses are made from two parts. So there's this piece, which goes in the front, and then there's a piece that kind of wraps around the back, and that's called the skirt. So this is the apron, skirt goes around. Um, and aprons are made in many different ways. This particular one, it was a piece of buckskin that was cut into strips wrapped in bear grass you'll notice up top here and then braided bear grass was braided over it there are these juniper seeds or juniper you know, juniper berry seeds that are kind of all throughout here there's also some little shells and colored beads and things like that and then some more braided, braided bear grass here at the bottom this is an apron made by Ina Faustino who's Yurok um, we have one of her relatives actually on the board which is pretty cool um, this was made in the 1930s. So of course, regalia making continues. It's not just kind of a thing that happened once and now doesn't happen. It is definitely alive and well. Got the ceremonial cap here. I'll talk a little bit more about caps as we go along because we have many of those. So this is a 1950s era dress, um, or at least a skirt. So this is the piece that would wrap around the back. You can kind of see in this picture here, this is the apron. That's the skirt kind of wrapping around the back. We'll have a better picture of it kind of a little down the way here. But this is a buckskin skirt that's got shells on it. It's got beads. It's got obsidian pieces, which is kind of unusual. You don't really see many. At least I haven't seen very many um, with these obsidian kind of shards on them. Abalone, we got some more beads. Um, and we have some pine nuts down here as well and some paint. 
That's from the 1950s. So of course, materials change over time when it comes to dressmaking. Like this one. This is kind of an interesting one. This is also by Ina Faustino. This is from the 1950s. This one was made with Army Conservation Corps. It looks like canvas, like fabric canvas. And then there's also these beads. And that's something that this large scale beading is something that you don't see on older dresses, which is really interesting. I'd love to see this one um, you know, laid out so we could see the whole part. But here's just part of it. <clears throat> So these are, so this is an example of an apron. This is the back of the apron. This is an example of the skirt. You can see the back of the skirt here. So we have the, of course, kind of strips of, um, strips of deer hide with the bear grass wrapped around it. And then there's these little, little clamshells that are also added onto it. And some braided bear grass, which I love how those braids look. They look awesome. And then um, abalone shells. This is an older skirt. This is from the late 1800s. Um, trying to see if, I don't think this, this one doesn't have any beads on it, but sometimes you will see older pieces like this that actually do have beads on them, like this, these blue beads on these hair ties. Let me see if I can zoom in. There we go. So those are Russian blue trade beads. Those were brought here from Russian fur traders who would trade the beads for supplies they needed from local tribes. So sometimes you'll actually see these show up on these older aprons and dresses. Um, and then it seems kind of uh, weird, but this kind of newspaper idea gives you a, kind of a good idea of how the dresses are actually worn. So there's kind of this front cover of the North Coast Journal. This part is the apron, and this part that wraps around is the skirt. And this is a plan for um, a project that the museum's working on right now, where they're gonna make a, we're gonna make a um, skirt to go with this apron. This is a very small apron. We have many in the collection that, for one reason or another, came to us either it was just the apron or it was just the skirt, and they've just kind of been in the collection. Um, so there's a project to, make a skirt that will go with this apron, and then we'll be able to loan it out to local tribes to use in different dances. So right now we're working slowly but surely on processing pine nuts. So this is just kind of a little dish of pine nuts. We're gonna need a lot of pine nuts for a skirt though. So this is an ongoing project. The Seroptimists are helping us fund it. Um, we're really looking forward to being able to involve the community again and working on this. It's just gonna be a bit particularly because of Corona. All right, and I'm hoping, so Nealis Hall, you could walk around Nealis Hall for literally hours and learn a whole bunch of stuff and not get to everything. So I'm kind of gonna hop around, check out a couple spots. Um, we're hoping to do more videos in here um, with some of our board members who are particularly um, knowledgeable on the Nealis Hall collections. We typically have a Nealis Hall curator that manages this building, or this basically this collection, um, because there is so much that goes into it. Um, but right now we currently don't have one. We are hiring though, so if you go onto our job, or if you go onto our website, click on About Us, I believe is what it says, About Us, um, Staff and Board, and then scroll down to the bottom of that page, you can see the job posting there. So we got some baby baskets. <clears throat> Whoo, my voice is tired. <laughs> um, so this case here, this is the Hover collection. So this is a collection of baskets. This is only part of it, if you can believe it. Um, that was put together by Karuk women who were basket weavers, had friends who were basket weavers. Um, and their families. So th this is a very, very significant collection for the museum to have. Um, and we swap out this display uh, at least once a year, if not twice. Um, and there are just some incredible baskets and also non-basket items that are in this collection as well. 
So we'll just kind of take a little gander at these. And I'm hoping to do a video on how to identify baskets, different types of baskets, things like that. So. Just take a quick little look around. So like I mentioned earlier, these are caps. I'll talk a little bit about these. So these are pretty much all well, from, from my knowledge, these are pretty much fancy caps. So these would be ones that would be worn in ceremony, at special events, things like that. Um, sometimes you'll see some that are kind of less elaborate. Um, they might, you know, only have um, the red coloring on them. Um, you know, so those caps would be worn in everyday life. When you're going around picking up acorns and processing things and walking on the beach, you might wear a less fancy hat and you'd save these for special events. It would be like if someone were to wear a top hat every day. That would look kind of unusual. Um, you would wear a regular hat, maybe a baseball hat when you're going around walking around rather than a top hat. And of course these are all still made today and they're all still, well these ones aren't all used in ceremony, but um, Fancy caps are still used in ceremony. You'll see them around at all kinds of different events. Mm -hmm. Got some acorn processing. Um, I believe we posted a video on how these all kind of, all these baskets work together to produce tasty acorn. So I highly recommend checking that out. And this is a special edition, or addition I would say, to the Nealis Hall collection, or at least the displays. So kind of got to step way the heck back here so we can kind of see everything. So of course we have the canoe, which is this. That's all carved redwood. We have the nets, which are, have been here for a bit, and that's an eel basket. And then of course this other net here. But these portraits are new. We've had them for a while, but they're new to this display. Um, so these are all basket weavers that were interviewed in the 80s um, about basket weaving and about different traditions. Um, so we were able to get names, I think, on most of them. This one, I think I need to, st I still need to add her name to it. Um, but the interviews that these women and some men did um, are, were used to put together a book called Baskets and Weavers that the um, the museum sells. So you can always come and check that out. Um, I mentioned earlier there's a, uh, those two, well the apron and the skirt that we looked at a little earlier by Ina Faustino. That's her right there. And we hope to add some more modern basket weavers onto this kind of wall display of basket weavers. This is an active tradition, of course. It didn't just end. It is definitely still around. Um, so if you know of any local weavers that you think we should add to our wall of weavers, feel free to let us know. There we go. This of course is, this is also kind of one of my favorite pieces here, um, is the recreated Redwood House. Um, Take a little peek in here. So of course, if this was an actual house, there would be a wall here, it wouldn't be open, but this is so we can all peek inside. So that's the door to get out and to get into the house. And then there's kind of this, um, you see there's a staircase here, and then this is kind of a pit in there. So with these houses, um, women and children would live in these houses, they kind of do all their living down here. Um, and then large storage baskets, like kind of one of the ones we saw a little bit earlier, would be arranged around this outside. Um, and then men would live in sweat houses. And I probably need, I need to learn some more about that kind of thing. Um, but if you want to see a full-size version of one of these houses, um, Sumeg Village in Patrick's Point has them. They were built by 
um, elders who wanted to teach younger people in the tribe to how traditional house building is done. So you can see those houses and you can walk in them. Um, and that's an active uh, ceremony site as well. So there are ceremonies that take part there. Currently though, um, those ceremonies aren't happening, at least at Sumeg, um, because of COVID. Um, but if you get a chance to go up there, uh, definitely go check it out. It's pretty incredible to see these big houses in the pit, or these huge houses, pit houses. Uh, yeah, definitely check it out. So let's see, Dina says, Verna Reese, I'd like to see there on the wall. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, feel free to send us her info. Um, I'd love to get in contact with her and see if we can add her picture under the wall. So this exhibit space will actually, I'm gonna start over here. So this is an exhibit called When Designs Escaped Baskets. And this has to do with traditional basket designs moving on to different um, kind of mediums. I'd say. So, um, of course, there's basket weaving. And then when kind of settlement happens, traditions are all shook up. So um, there was lack of access to basket materials. There was the danger of possibly being killed by settlers and all these things, along with the cultural genocide that was going on definitely had an effect on baskets, but it didn't completely end the tradition of baskets because these designs that were on saved on these baskets and saved in the minds of the weavers could move on to different um, mediums. So, and of course then once you get into kind of the more present time period as well, um, there would be things like it would be hard to access materials because now the materials you need to make baskets are now on privately owned land. So how do you continue to produce these designs when you can't necessarily weave? Um, so we'll take a look here. So one of those kind of ways that designs would be saved is through things like ceramics, like this pot, or through necklace making, jewelry making. You know, these designs show up onto t-shirts and mugs and hats and um, graduation regalia. Um, and these designs, of course, persist today not only on baskets, but on things that tribes produce, tribes and related tribal groups produce. And of course, now basket weaving is, has been making a comeback. So now you'll start seeing these newer weaved baskets showing these old designs, but also showing innovative designs. And of course, a lot, so something that a lot of people don't know is that a good chunk of the baskets in the Clark Museum are actually produced um, kind of in the 1900s, especially around 1920, 1930. And let's see, I think, so except for one, two, yeah, all of these except for two of them, possibly three, were all made 1900 and after, particularly 1920, 1930. Um, there was a large trade in baskets. So what would happen is there would be people traveling from out of the area. They'd come up here, they'd purchase baskets, and then they'd take them back to places like L.A., um, Arizona, the Southwest, and they would sell them. And this was a way for weavers to make money to buy food, buy different supplies that they needed, um, and continue weaving. Um, and a lot of the museum's collections, particularly the Hailstone collection and Parts of the Hover collection were from this era because there was a lot of basket weaving going on. And of course, this had an effect on patterns. This had an effect on basket designs. This had an effect on actual baskets themselves. This is not really a traditional basket that you would see pre-contact. Um, and you'll see a couple more actually just over here as well. These are all pretty, pretty different shapes. It's kind of tall shape. This is over a, a bottle, I think. Yeah, it doesn't say what kind of bottle, but some sort of bottle. We have these pedestal baskets, things with knobs on them, another pedestal basket. These very different designs 
that you don't see on pre-contact baskets. Um, and these were all caused by the, the kind of collision of culture of settlement communities wanting these specific forms from weavers and weavers weaving them to sell them to make money and to make a living. And Brizards, you might be familiar with um, that name here in Humboldt County, they, um, they would actually send people out specifically to buy baskets to, sta to stock their stores. That's what this big picture is back here. And actually, if you look pretty closely at these baskets and you take a look at our collections, you'll actually see many of these baskets in our collection, which is really, really kind of crazy to think. Um, it's a very small world. But anyway, Brizards would make these, um, these catalogs, which you kind of see here. Let's take a look. Um, that he would send out to people, and then people could send their money, and then he'd send the basket, or they'd come up and pick it up. And this basket we actually have, and it's actually, oh yeah, here, let's go take a look. So this basket is just right over here. So at one point in time, this passed through the hands of Brizards. Many of these baskets probably did. We don't have documentation on all of their travels, but that's one of them. And so I kind of pointed out the pottery earlier. Um, so there's a group up in Hoopa called the Hoopa Pottery Guild. This was from 1955. Let's look. <clears throat> and this uh, in the truck here, that's Josephine Peters. Um, representing the Hoopa Pottery Guild in what I'm assuming is a parade, maybe a 4th of July parade. I'm not really sure. It's just guessing from the flag. Um, but the Hoopa Pottery Guild was a group that came together and used local clay um, to make all kinds of different bowls. But you'll notice that these feature traditional designs. So let me just tell you a little bit of the story here. Um, so 1951, there was a lady named Laura Black, who was a non-native field nurse. She was working on the Hoopa Reservation. And she noticed that there was clay in the valley. And she knew how to make pottery. So she used those skills and then recruited other women to start making pottery. So they were using that local clay, incorporating it into these pots, and then including local basket designs. Um, and these still, you'll still see these around. They sometimes occasionally come up for sale. Uh, someone actually contacted me recently about um, one of these pots and was asking about who made it and things like that. Um, unfortunately, the pottery studio was lost in the 1964 flood. Um, but it continued into the 70s and 80s. Um, and some of these are kind of more modern pots, you'll see, like that one. 1995 to 2000. Pretty, pretty incredible little pieces. And then here's kind of some more um, traditional baskets alongside kind of these more modern variations. And then some of these kind of mini baskets, these mini tobacco baskets, miniature cooking basket. These are kind of more modern ones. All right, so these are kind of cases that explore more specific designs like the frog's hand design. This is kind of one of my favorite designs. Look at that teacup, that's pretty cool. But um, I really like this design. This hat or this cap is also pretty incredible. Just imagine all the skill it takes to do those little teeny tiny weaves. So there's, of course, a ton more we could say about the Nealis Hall collection. But unfortunately, I think we have about 10 more minutes or so. Um, and yeah, I want to use that time to kind of answer some questions if you guys have them or if there's anything particular you want to see in the museum that's in the display if you want me to get up a closer, better view of it. 
let me know here in the comments. I'll kind of continue wandering around a little bit. Um, and feel free to ask questions in the comments as well. Um, and for those of you who've got a, got a ski daddle, thank you for joining us. I hope you learned something new. Um, and I hope when we reopen to the public um, on a date to be announced, of course, um, we hope to see you around. So we'll kind of just do some little wandering here. And of course, even though I've worked here for, you know, two and a half years, every time I walk around, I see something new, which is um, kind of makes this job a lot of fun. Never know what you're going to see. This is probably one of my favorite caps. Also, if, um, so we get a lot of questions about where our baskets come from. How do we verify that they are kind of, they come to us in a culturally sensitive way, things like that. Um, if you've ever had any questions about that in the museum um, and how we relate to what's known as NAGPRA, the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act, we do have a document up on the website under the Nealis Hall page that talks about the museum and NAGPRA. Um, and how that's all connected. We do get a lot of questions about where did our baskets come from? Do we have things that were stolen? What's the deal with Cecile Clark and her students and their um, archeological digs on Tulawat Island? Um, we talk a good bit about that in that NAGPRA document. It's called the Clark and NAGPRA. Um, so if you have any questions about that, definitely feel free to check it out. Um, and if you have any questions that you don't think we addressed, um, in that particular document, feel free to let us know and we'll kind of do what we can. So we had a question about what the design is on this cap. I believe you said it was the cap I pointed at, so I'm guessing it's this one. So let's see, it says it's the friendship design with snake nose. So from what I'm familiar with, um, the friendship design kind of denotes a circle design um, and then snake nose, of course, is kind of these triangle shapes that you'll see on the side here. Um, but I've seen friendship design kind of noted in many different ways. So that is probably something up for um, kind of discussion. But it's a pretty gorgeous cap. This is also a pretty great bowl. You can see the weave. So we have someone that just commented, I had you on my calendar for an in-person visit next week, but I know that's not possible now, so this was great. Thank you. Well, thanks, Janet. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I hope you learned something new, um, and I hope this kind of made up a little bit for the fact that you weren't able to visit. Um, but when we do reopen, please definitely consider coming in and visiting in person. Um, it's definitely a whole different experience, um, I like to say, when it comes to visiting the museum um, in person rather than digitally. Um, for me, a lot of that has to do with the, the smell. <laughs> um, a lot, I've had a lot of people say that um, when they walk into the museum, it just has that old stuff smell, uh, which is very true. Um, it reminds me a lot of my grandma's basement, which I kind of spend a lot of time in uh, when my grandparents were still around. They lived in Wisconsin in the same house for 60 years. Um, so, yeah, and our museum has that kind of old stuff smell. Here's some basket materials. <coughs> so if you're wondering what, so what the baskets are made out of, bear grass is a major component. 
There's also hazel sticks. This is where the baskets get their structure. Um, and then willow roots show up in many of the cooking baskets, particularly willow and spruce. Um, yeah, because these both, um, when they come into contact with water, they expand and they make the baskets basically waterproof. So you can put water in them, you can cook stuff in them, um, and you're not going to leak out a bunch of water all over the place. Some of the baskets you'll notice have kind of a yellow color, or um, that's from these porcupine quills that are dyed using this moss or lichen. And then the black parts of the basket are made out of this maidenhair fern. Um, and from what I've heard, this is very hard to work with. So baskets that feature a lot of black work are made by someone who has a lot of skill working with, um, with maidenhair. And of course, all of these take a lot of time to process. They take a lot of time to collect. Um, and it's, it's a very, it's a long process to do the work to make baskets, not even just making the baskets, but preparing everything. It can take you, you know, a year to get everything you need um, because you're working with the seasons. And so this is woodwardia fern that's been uh, dyed with alder bark. So that's kind of the, the alder bark there. And that's how you get those, um, you know, deep red colors that show up on a lot of these baskets. Um, this is what woodwardia fern looks like when it's undyed. Sorry, everything's upside down. I'm standing kind of on the wrong side of the case. <laughs> um, and if you're wondering what a basket looks like when it gets started, so these are those sticks. You make what's called a button, and then you got to start working your way out, around and around and around. Um, this is a cap that was in the process of being made, round and round and round and round. And this... Um, this it looks like an unfinished basket barrette, so hairpiece. Then this is what a basket looks like right before it's about to be finished. You gotta trim all those little pieces. So those are when you're weaving around. Um, when you get to the end of you know, your bear grass or your um, maidenhair fern, you just kinda trim it a bit, but then you keep weaving and then you have to go back and trim everything out afterwards. <clears throat> All right, so I think we're at about time. So thanks again, everyone. I'll flip this thing around. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in today. Um, I hope you learned something. I hope you had a good time. If you have any other questions that you might want to have answered, feel free to put them still in the comments here. We do still read them. Um, you can also email them to us. Um, our email is admin, A-D-M-I-N, at Clark Museum, and Clark has an E, C-L-A-R-K-E, museum.org, and we can go ahead and answer those for you. Of course, to stay in the loop on when we're going to be reopening, um, feel free to follow us on Facebook, check our website, join our um, email list, which can also be done on our website. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter um, to stay up to date on what's happening here. In the meantime, um, we hope to see you soon. We'll probably be doing another video next week, a uh, topic to be announced. So we hope to see you around soon. And in the meantime, stay safe, wear a mask. We'll get through this. <laughs> Thanks again, guys.